So you want to build a giant enterprise platform. Great. You want mission critical data and private data to flow between CRMs, other critical applications flawlessly, no leaks, no breaches, no compromise. You also want to build infinite user controls and optionality and also smooth and seamless user identification to access these business apps. No pressure, right? We've seen an increased focus on data security and privacy over the last like 15 years. One of the things that makes me really excited and is one of the reasons I loved and picked this area to work is the intersection of data security and privacy and usability. And that's a place where I think we've seen a lot of evolution. Marla Hay is the Senior Director of Product, Security and Privacy at Salesforce, and she knows how to balance critical security with smooth identity management. It's actually one of the key reasons she's in the field. Data and privacy are two hot button issues right now, but a company's concerns over these two topics isn't insular. The worry goes beyond the data on internal networks and into the idea of what's happening to the information that gets sent out to other services as well. On this episode of IT Visionaries, Marla explains how Salesforce designs its products and services, including a detailed look at the feedback loops her team has in place to ensure product quality. Plus, Marla touches on the evolution of digital identities and how Salesforce is managing those permissions. IT Visionaries is brought to you by the Salesforce platform, the world's most trusted low-code platform. Enhance trust, compliance, and governance across all your apps with Salesforce security. Learn more at salesforce.com slash data security. Welcome everyone to another episode of IT Visionaries. And today we have Marla Hay. She is a specialist, senior director of product security and privacy at Salesforce. Marla, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you so much. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Awesome. Listen, Salesforce, we know is a huge company and security is a huge domain. So specifically tell our audience, what is it that you work on in that domain for Salesforce? Yeah, absolutely. So I work in an area of the company called Platform, which is basically what customers build their applications upon. It's also where things like um, service and sales um, live. And my product area is all about how do we create additional security and privacy around our customers' applications. So we do security and privacy products. So things like um, additional levels of encryption, things like um, monitoring events and understanding the things that are happening within your system so that you can better understand potential security threats. We do monitoring for specific security threats. And then we also have privacy products that do things like help manage GDPR and CCPA, um, and all of the awesome uh, privacy laws that have been uh, coming up over the last couple of years um, with things like data subject rights, preferences, consent, all that great stuff. Yeah, because so for our audience that's not aware, Salesforce is almost like, I mean, it's almost like the app store, um, the platform division where different app developers can develop apps, integrations into their existing products. And we also know Salesforce itself houses potentially, you know, data that certainly people want to keep private with how much money is being transferred, uh, customer service records. Uh, there's a lot of information there. And what I wanted to kind of hear your perspectives on is how do you guys evaluate what is, you know, what is accessible versus not accessible? Because that's, that's at the core of like one of the challenges I always feel like with API driven companies or marketplace platform companies is they have to decide what information are they going to make accessible to the app makers? Because, you know, yes, if you unlock it, there's a lot of potential for great benefit, but every time you unlock something, there's also potential security risk, which of course you're in charge of mitigating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, so absolutely. So I think the kind of the foundational premise is like, we are a steward of our uh, customer data. So our data belongs to our customers. So what we wanna do is put in place things that make it really easy for our customers to control and manage access to that data. So we have put in place a very robust set of things like user permissions and app level permissions, page level permissions, so that our customers can create exactly the degree of access that they want for their entire ecosystem. So that might mean something like um, they're giving access just to specific, uh, if you've got, for example, uh, an application that does service management. So people are, uh, your if you're one of our customers, your customers are coming in to say like, hey, I've got, where's my order? I need some help with, uh, with something. 
uh, and you want to give your agent access to just the just the exact amount of data that they need to help your customers. We've got things that can help um, keep that data safe at the app level, so you can you can get permissions down to hey, they can see this exact set of information uh, fields on an on an application that you build, or underneath that at the database level, you've got things like object level permissioning or field level security that protect the data um, kind of at multiple layers so that you can get really specific and granular about who has access uh, to what and for what reasons. I'd love for you to share a little bit about how you guys plan to make things available. So do you think of it more in terms of, hey, listen, we'll just make all data extremely encrypted and secure so we don't have to worry about how it's being used in the other applications or cross applications? Or do you think to yourselves, hey, we have to think about ramifications and so on? Just in general, how would you say your approach is when it comes to like designing, you know, APIs, gateways, however you want to describe it, that allows these platform applications to access, you know, critical data fields? Yeah, absolutely. So that same level of permissioning also applies on the API. So if you say, hey, this field's accessible to this type of API user, you can do it that way. We also have things you mentioned, encryption. We've got, um, we have a product uh, platform encryption that can encrypt at the field level so that you can get very specific about if there's certain data that you really don't want um, to be accessed externally, you can apply this layer of encryption at that field level to ensure that it's protected uh, at the most granular level. And then at the API level, you're, you can protect those API calls at kind of the, the object and field level um, based on the API user. So if you've got an application that's, that's making an API call, you can run that as, an, as a particular type of user that has a particular level of access, and it will guarantee that that API can only reach the data that you've indicated that it can reach. So I remember for ourselves, when we were at, I was at a software company, when it was you know, time to build all these accesses permissions, it started becoming like, you know, for example, have you ever mapped out what everything leads to? For us, it was like spaghetti. We were like, I don't even know what's happening anymore. <laughs> that's how I. That's how I personally felt, you know. And so, I mean, <laughs> totally, I mean, that can, you could you can still do that. It is you that is possible. But I what so we're trying to do is kind of like look at the ways a customer would would organize this within their own business, and so yeah, and then provide um, methodologies that allow that allow you to gate that access based on how you're going to do that. So if you're looking at like what we were just talking about with the APIs, you could do something like, it could be role-based where you're like, for this role, this is the type of um, information they could have access to. And then you just apply the role to that, to that user. And then it's easy. You can reapply that role in different places. Or you can say, I've got a permission set and that permission set is going to be X, Y, Z. And I'm, and I'm going to dole out that permission set to particular, particular users. So it can, you can manage it in the way that you think about it from like the business perspective of like, well, this, this is my service agent. And so that person should have a particular role in this level of access or like this API is for this purpose. And I'm going to grant that API a, a permission set that has these specific things in it that has already been kind of blessed by our, um, our governance program or um, area of the business. And then from your perspective, how often, I guess, is, are these app makers pushing the limits of what the system currently enables? Do you continue to have app makers or partners, maybe even a Salesforce customer and an app maker partner come together and say, hey, listen, Marla, I need you to unlock this because, and this is the reason why. How is like, I guess the, you know, Salesforce is a very mature company, uh, but we also know technology, product design, innovation never stops. And so I was wondering like, what kind of velocity do you still see for like new requests, new capabilities being pushed upon you from the customer base and the developer base? Yeah, we so we've got just a really advanced, really incredible, smart developers on the platform, and so they are continuously pushing us uh, to make improvements and and to add functionality in all facets, um, from the API perspective, from the sharing perspective. We've got a really um, brilliant customer who has been um, kind of rally has le really led a rallying cry against the types of applications that require or utilize high level permissions, like modify all data or view all data, which is like a very, very major permission because you're saying, you're literally saying you have access to all the data in the system and it should be very, used very sparingly. And there are some applications that are using that permission level, but it means that anyone using that application all of a sudden has the keys to the kingdom. And so being able to create a way in our own applications that we're developing on the platform for ourselves internally to lock down 
what applications do and do not need modified data and being much more specialized about that. I'll give you an example of how that's affected the way we've done development just recently. So we have a, an API, it's a, it's a, a REST API that's based on getting consent for someone. And so you'll call this API and say, hey, do I have permission to email this person? So we've got, there are multiple places where that information could reside, that could reside on a contact, that could be on a lead, it could be on some of our, our newer consent data model objects. And so this API needs to look at multiple objects, make an assessment, do some logic and return a response. And so it would have been, uh, because it has to have a wide breadth of information, it, could, it would have been something in the past where maybe that application needs to have mod, uh, view all data permissions. So instead of doing that, thanks in, in part to the advocacy uh, of people like the, the person I mentioned earlier, uh, we created a basically a specialized permission set just for this API that looks only at consent data and returns an aggregate response. And so we've really locked down our own API. So instead of um, even that API having view all data access, it only has access to these specific pieces, fields, and um, objects that it, that it needs to to get that consent data. So that kind of um, oversight and, and precision uh, is something that we're paying a lot more attention to now, thanks in part to our developer community. You know, I'd love for you to kind of discuss how you even make decisions on this level, because you, know, you just described something that was very thorough in regards to like, hey, you have to really consider X, Y, Z, you know, the permission sets, users, object level data, because the community is always asking, going to ask you for more access. That's just how it's going to be forever, right? <laughs> and you're always going to be, I need more protection forever. And there's going to be more use cases. Every single day, there's probably a new use case. It's like, hey, I need this for a new reason. And of course, some require a feature and some can probably be solved with existing technology or existing code base. But for yourself, you know, being a person in product, security, what's the evaluation process like on your team before you decide to implement something? Like, do you guys run through all the scenarios? You try to punch holes in things? Do you guys do a sandbox test environment and just push the code in and be like, oh, let's see what happens when we do this? How do you guys evaluate what, it, what features to, you know, include, exclude, you know, do now versus do later? Yeah. So I think it's a, a robust process, but it's also, there's a bit of an art to it as well. So first is deciding which which we do and in which priority. Yeah. There's always going to be resource constraints. So it's really, we, we really listen to the community. We do a lot of for meetups, customer advisory groups where we talk to sets of customers. We have um, uh, open um, boards where customers can re request feature enhancements. And then of course, customers of the security and privacy products that are the add-on products, not beyond like the things like platform encryption and the, and the privacy product I mentioned earlier, we'll have dedicated customers and then we've got a built-in base that are kind of paying for these additional products that are, that are always feeding us fantastic requests. So we kind of look at how can we help the greatest number of customers or where do we think are the biggest or the places that will drive huge impact? Maybe if it's for a fewer number of customers, but they really, really have to have it. It's something that they, they really are stuck unless we do it. And so those are the, that's sort of how we weigh the utility of those things in order to include those functions. And then in terms of like, how are we building it? Are we putting it into a sandbox? Are we tr trying to check it out? We have an entire area of the organization that is just dedicated to trying to break our stuff before, before it goes live. Oh, that sounds like a fun group. <laughs> yeah. That sounds like a fun group to be a part of. They are security oriented and it, everything that we do goes through that group first. So there's a lot of uh, cycles <laughs> sometimes where we are changing, updating things, narrowing scope. We do that both from the security perspective. We also do it from the privacy perspective. We also put everything we do through a privacy uh, review so that we have another team that's looking at like how, what data is being used? How is it being used? Where is it being stored? How is it being stored? Who has access to it? And that's just really a fantastic way to make sure whatever it is we're doing, we're, we're doing it right. And it also has made the teams, and this is not specific just to our team, this is, this is uh, company-wide, really have an eye towards both those things to begin with so that when they get to those groups, there, we're now, they'll know, hey, these are the things they've seen before with our stuff. So let's look at that off the, uh, right out of the gate before it even gets to that team. It's really driven a security and privacy mindset, not just for the security and privacy teams, but for everyone at Salesforce. 
Wait, listen, when you're, when you, is it like a competition between you and that, uh, that like a uh, lock breaking team? I don't even know what to call them, like the jailbreaking team, like the team that's trying to break your stuff. Is it like a competition? Like, oh, we beat them today. <laughs> <laughs> there is a little bit of satisfaction for sure when you get to the end of the process and, and there was no, nothing major. Like, that is a huge badge of honor for, for a team. We had nothing that is above a particular like severity level that was found. And that's, that means you did a pretty good job right out of the gate. But yeah, it's more, it's more collaborative and friendly than, than that. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. You know, you've been in the software industry for quite some time, managing different products from Mentor Graphics to Jan Rain when you were the director of product. Talk a little bit about what you've seen evolve in like, obviously security's always been part of software. Obviously, it still has a ways to go. Like nothing's ever done, just like in software, nothing's ever done. It's just an evolution. Talk about how security privacy has evolved in your time developing software and products because you have you know, over 15 years experience prior to just joining Salesforce. And of course, these different products have done different things. And I'm sure you've worked on many, many projects within these companies, but we'd love to hear a little bit about you know, how you've seen the evolution. And then part of it, I feel like is more like, is it, is the evolution because it's more customer side? It seems like customers are demanding more privacy and data security, but I'm not sure. I'd love to hear your perspective on that. Yeah, I think so. Definitely we've seen an increased focus on data security um, and privacy over the last like 15 years. We've also seen really great, one of the things I've been that makes me really excited and, and, and one of the, is one of the reasons I love and pick this area to work is the um, intersection of data security, privacy, and usability. Mm -hmm. And that's a place where I think we've seen a lot of evolution. So it used to be if our customers had super high level of security to get into their applications, you're going to see tokens um, for to access those things, like physical hardware tokens. Like RSAs. Yeah, I remember those. Exactly. <laughs> the number will change every 10 seconds or whatever the number was. I was like, ah, yes. geez, I can't even type it in fast enough. I know. They always went so fast. I always felt like I, it was like, I felt like I was disarming a bomb or a Mission Impossible <laughs> or something. Just like, hurry up and fumbling the, uh, yes, it was very, very high stress. Um, so that having that shift to things like multi-factor authentication, to biometric authentication, or to kind of like passive authentication are things that I have been really excited to see come, things we've been wanting to do for a long time and really see, have seen come to fruition in those cases where now you, uh, those hardware tokens are now in, in your app and you're just, you're authenticating through virtue of the fact that I mean, 15, 15 years ago, it was, if it was not a given. Everybody has a cell phone sitting in their pocket and can easily download an app and, and you, or access the app for the um, application that you're using and, and push a button to authenticate into it. Now, that is absolutely a, a given, and that's something that, um, that we can use to do things like multi-factor authentication. And then in addition to that, the rise of then kind of the passive authentication, where like, I, I can see your keystrokes. I know where you are. I know your behavior patterns are, are typical. And so if you have, will give me permission to do that, I will auto-authenticate you uh, without you actually having to even push the button. Like we, I know enough about exactly what's happening and I'm, I'm pretty sure that this is you. So seeing that, seeing it go all the way to kind of like the, to get to there is something that we talked about 10 years ago and it feels like it is becoming more ubiquitous, which is really exciting. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the days of, no more passwords. It feels like it's light years away. I keep hearing people say we're getting there. Um. <laughs> I know. This is why I said this is exactly, this is like the thing I was most excited about, like at the beginning of, of my career is like, I'm going to, I'm going to be part of the, the movement that kills passwords. And it, now it just feels like, now I have to laugh because it's like, ah, oh, it's like, it feels uh, like a, you know, sweet summer child. <laughs> just, it's like it's like a, just some weed in your garden it just always comes back it just never <laughs> comes back you know what i mean i looked at my one password recently and i looked at how many passwords i had saved as well as my browser i was like oh my gosh like if anyone found my computer i'm one password away from losing it all you know I mean? <laughs> exactly <laughs> you know one of the things that you, and you're right one of the things that was very different i feel like uh in 2000 in the 2000s i was a consultant at the time and I remember most corporations or most businesses, they didn't really allow their employees to just download whatever. 
Like it was like software was pushed to them. Yes. Um, it was pushed from central IT. You know, if they said you could have my Windows XP, you like you were you were blessed by the gods because you were still probably weren't running Windows ninety five at the time. Um, but whatever <laughs> the case may be, it was it was all pushed. You didn't have user selection. But now more than ever, you already know this. Bring your own devices. There's there's uh you know the policies are looser. I would say you just more things integrating all the time, and that also creates a new problem, which is, I would say, accidental authentication, right? Where people are not that clear on what they've given their own employees access to, and that allows them to authenticate, download, install, implement, connect apps. And I'm sure it happens at the Salesforce platform level. Is there a rise or is that is that like a new budding field where like people have to figure out how to like, is it like educational where you have to teach more people? Like this is what you have set up. Is it more service oriented where there's like a rise of services that helps you integrate applications because most people have no idea what their permission settings are anyways. What is happening to help in this arena? Because I feel like permissioning is now this new arena where you might've engineered the solution, Marla, to protect data privacy. But what you haven't accounted for is me, the customer. I have no idea what my settings are. So <laughs> I, I let something in. I don't know what's going on. Right. If you meet, yeah. And like, so from like an employee perspective where you've got, which is, is now happening, right? And I remember talking about this, we were assessing like, what do we do with the concept of our own employees bringing um, devices to work? Like 12, 13 years ago, it was like, this is going to happen. Like, what do we do about it? And I think it's um, safeguarding the things that need to be safeguarded and protecting, kind of cordoning off access to the things that are critical infrastructure and ensuring that those things are only accessible through additional step of authentication, that um, those things are not accessible by any app that's just sitting on the device unless that has been pre-approved or authenticated so that you're limiting the damage that someone could do to themselves by downloading something that maybe they is not the safest thing for them to have downloaded or isn't on the pre-approved like company software list or isn't a pre-approved like pre-configured uh, company device. I think that's sort of the, the approach that, that we're seeing where if you're, most of the things that are mission critical for the work that we're doing is one, it's now also all for the most part for us, I know that's not true for, for every company uh, at this point, a lot of it's cloud-based now too. So like, mm -hmm. I don't really need any specific machine to do my work. I'm authenticating into an application to do what I need to do. And that application is actually residing on some much more secure machine somewhere. And so there's, it limits the damage that I could do company-wide. And that is, that's a way to approach it. I mean, and of course, that's excluding things where your company itself is, uh, has uh, software in it that, that has its own malware. This is just a, in reference to uh, someone accidentally downloading something that maybe isn't the safest thing. Yeah. And how do you, how do you guys, what is your thought process on this like transfer of responsibility? Because you're absolutely right. Most software today is in the cloud. So I, it's like machineless, right? Any machine I use, I can use the, the critical tools to do my job. If I have the right authentication tool or, you know, there's plenty of identity access management tools where if I log in one place, I can then, you know, leapfrog into whatever other cloud applications I need. But one of the things that I was curious about is a lot of, companies, Salesforce included, needs data interconnected. And your your customers do as well. That's why the whole all platform exists for the sole reason. It needs data interconnected. Where, what are your philosophies on like who is in charge of what? Because like even with a simple application like Calendly, right? You install it and then it says, oh, Calendly wants access to your whole calendar. It's like, oh, <laughs> you know, we, we just say, okay, <laughs> you know, not thinking like, what does that mean? I was like, well, it literally means everything you put in the calendar. Like, you know, you need to go to the hospital for whatever. It's going to be there. Calendly knows this, right? And Calendly has a burden of responsibility to protect that information. Your calendar system, whether it's Google or Microsoft or something else, it's got a burden of responsibility to protect that information. But that's just one connection. We know data in business flows across many, 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 many applications. Mm -hmm. You can also Salesforce your stance, your stance. What is your stance? You know, who's in charge of what? Because once the data gets out of your system, granted, if it was granted and everything's permissioned correctly, you know, you're not at fault. In, or if, if something happens to it, it's not, it's not your job. Yet, if it happens, I'm sure you have to, you know, defend yourself or, I don't know, Salesforce has to be like, hey, listen, let me show you my proof and checks and balances to make sure like, you know, that I didn't lose the data. It's something you authenticated into this. 
Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, totally. Yeah. I think, I mean, it's a really a shared responsibility. And so there's, there's kind of two aspects to it. One is from the employer perspective, ensuring that you understand when, how, uh, and why data is exfiltrating your system or infiltrating your system, but exfiltrating your system. We're talking about kind of more that case. And so that's thing like with something like Salesforce, you can, you have things like transaction security. So transaction security will basically say, it will tell you if you, you can set it up basically to say, I want to know, or I want to stop data from leaving the system based on this criteria. Mm. So that's like, that's kind of gate one. That's the employer responsibility. The employer is going to make sure I, I want the data that needs to stay here stays here. And I'm making a decision about what data I'm okay with leaving under certain circumstances. Then the next set of responsibility is with is the employee responsibility. And this is just a matter of trust and, and training is, is going to be a huge part of, hey, if you need to pull this data out for some reason, for a sanctioned reason, you now have to be sure you're treating it with the utmost level of care and responsibility. And it's not something that should be done lightly or often. I mean, so like as an individual, like there's almost no reason I would take a set of critical data and like download it onto my machine. There are a few applications where that I might that might be the case, but generally speaking, uh, that those are going to be rare instances. And I am acutely aware, although I'm maybe not the target for this because I'm in the security and privacy industry, <laughs> <laughs> that now I've got something very sensitive on my machine, and I need to, and I also want it eliminated as soon as possible. So I think there's a level of training that needs to go into that. And people, when they understand like what their um, the kind of level of responsibility that they've been given, I think they'll act in a way that is accordance, in accordance with that responsibility. Then the other element is like of that responsibility is not just download for the employee's responsibility. It's not just like I'm downloading this onto my machine, which is pretty obvious, but then like connections to third-party systems. So if you've got data that's in a highly protected system yep. and you've got an ex, say you've got an external analytics application. And so you've got a connection that's going to run to that external analytics application. In theory, your employer has already sanctioned the one, the API calls to move those things back and forth into the security of that third-party application. And if they haven't, and you're, just, you're downloading something and pulling that in, then you're back to kind of like the previous scenario where it's, that's really a matter of training employees to understand the responsibility that they have with sensitive data. No, I, I like that. I'll give you an example. We, uh, a while ago, I was in a deal with one of the big movie studios and we were reading through their contracts and it said like, Hey, if you are the one or the company, your software is the reason why let's say like the leak to a major movie comes out, you give up the ending, you give, they wanted you to have uncapped liability because they said literally you could cost us hundreds of millions of dollars. If you like re revealed the, like on a movie release, <laughs> um, you know, where it project, cause it's true. Like some of these movies have a projected $100 million opening and they say, Oh, well, if you leak the, you leak the ending, it's a surprise ending. Like, you know, let's go back in time, like six cents with that hook twist ending. Oh yeah. You leak the ending. You're going to cost me yeah. tens of, you know, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars. Like, and I'm like, what do you want me to do, man? I'm a, we're a software. They're like, no, you need to guarantee protection, you know, down, you know, yeah. and, I was, and I'm curious on your opinions on that, because that's true. Like most files, like, like if we were to think about the more we collaborate today in remote places, the more data information is moving across applications, networks, personal machines, like it's just being transferred in so many places. And so like when there is a breach or a loss of critical data, I always wonder like, how does anyone even figure out who lost it? Yeah. <laughs> like, like who lost Similarly, I have a story of a friend who is, um, does contracting and uh, he was in contracting for a company that it's similar, like, hey, if you leak any of this stuff, you're in big trouble, an entertainment company. But when he was working on building applications and working on their data, it was all real data. And it was like, wait, you're signing this thing that's saying, I'm not going to spill the beans on all of this data, but you never needed access to that data. Like, why did they even <laughs> like, so we, that was actually one of the genesis for a product that we built um, a couple of years ago called Data Mask, where basically like, it takes all the data in your Salesforce org. And when you move it over to like a sandbox mm. or developer, someplace where a developer or a contractor has access to it, it de-identifies all of that data. So it doesn't, and it de-identifies it with real looking data. So you can say something like, this is a city 
change all these real cities to fake city names and it just arbitrarily will select cities from a library or like change all these first names to real looking first names. So you can get, so if you've got like, like a subscriber list or something like that, and you've got names and addresses and phone numbers, mm. you'll still have names and addresses and phone numbers, but they're all completely fake manufactured data that you can give that then you can share with a third, with a contractor or developer, whoever else needs access to your data. Cause we had, that was a, and that was, that story was like, part of the impetus for that idea where it was like, they just didn't have a way to give like, you know, billions of re records in order to create an application that, that needed that m amount of data. They just didn't have a way to create that data in a realistic way that wasn't real data. And so they made them sign like a, just a, a crazy agreement that put them on the hook for a lot of my, for their lives, basically. <laughs> Yeah, listen, I was in a city, like not nothing like serious ramifications like that, but I know exactly what you're talking about because I worked on a project where we were converting utility, like a utility billing system, and they had no way of masking the records. So during the conversion process, everyone got to see, like everyone who worked on a project knew everyone in the city's records. Like we could look up their records for how many times they didn't pay their water bill, how many times had they been in default, what was their credit rating? Like it was crazy. And of course, you can also pull, because um, the city was pulling records on, your just total obligation to the city because pulling utilities is one of the only ways to get you to pay. <laughs> it sounds crazy, right? What credit cards you would bounce? Like I could look up everything. And I remember I was just a contractor. I'm just making training materials for um making training materials for how to use this utility billing system. Like, should I see all this stuff? Like, well, we didn't know how to mask it. Wow. <laughs> so you made me sign a note to promise I wouldn't tell anybody. I was like, yeah. yeah. God, totally. Yeah. I mean, it is necessary for some of those companies, but it doesn't have to be. That's why we need, we need more of uh, this type of um, functionality out there. Yeah, it's scary. But there's no... Yeah, contracts are the only way to do it for some of these, these places. Yeah, it's wild. Well, Marla, it was fun having you on the show. But before you leave, it is time for the lightning round. The lightning round is brought to you by the Salesforce platform, the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience. Marla, this is where we ask you questions outside of your world at Salesforce so that our audience can get to know you a little bit better. Are you ready? I think so. <laughs> okay, so we didn't, no, they're not two personal questions, but they are. We try to do a little homework, a little digging on you. All right, so listen, we looked you up on LinkedIn. You have listed a very interesting activity. You were went to Cornell and you were part of the Cornell Autonomous Underwater Vehicle Team. Sounds like you were making underwater sub robots. What were you doing? What was, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what we were doing. Yes, so it's a, it was a robot that basically was a competition happens once a year. You drop a robot into a into a bay, into the, like an ocean bay, and the uh, robot is has to go through a kind of a course self guide, and then identify um, some elements at the end, like number of pings, and like this is a a, a gate that it, that it's looking at, and so. Yes, yeah, so I was part of the team that worked on that robot. I, I was in the computer science program, so my portion of the of it was the um, kind of part of the vision system where it was it was detecting the things that it was looking at. Very old school vision uh, detection, and yeah, it was a super fun project. Uh, we did not win, and the submarine wandered off in to the wilderness, uh, never to be recovered. <laughs> it did well. We uh, ma making it sound like it just like we dropped it and it just like took off running. No, that's okay. Uh, it did not make it back, <laughs> which <laughs> I'm pretty, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure that, uh, I'm pretty sure that blame lines with me, to be honest. I'm picturing, I'm picturing the team looking at each other during the competition, like, well, this is somebody's fault. Like, <laughs> like not commit. <laughs> It's okay. Listen, we learn from our mistakes. So you're okay, right? You you learn from your mistakes. You were you were trying something new. You know, you grew up, you mentioned earlier before we started the recording that you grew up in Oregon. You know, when do you think you were really interested because in computer science, we saw that you went to school for computer science at Cornell, you went to you got your masters from Hopkins in the same subject. I personally have a daughter. I want her to be interested in more STEM things. I mean, she's only 6, so who knows what she's going to be interested in. But when did you personally become interested in technology versus uh you know any other subject yeah i'd say um probably like late junior high early high school um and i started just like with basically making web pages and the, and like with you know this is like super oh, this is like early 90s so i'm no i don't have an editor or anything i got like a 
subscription to like a ISP. I, can, I wish I could remember what it was because it was like the only one you could get. And then I w- like edited code in like Notepad and then like uh, l- uploaded it via FTP to this site. Just made like basic web pages just for fun. It was a, and I loved it. It was just like I loved doing, I loved working on it. It was really fun and interesting. And I've always kind of been interested in both in like technology and then the intersection of like technology and people. So at the time I was like, oh, I would really like to kind of study like AI. Uh, cognition was what it, what it was sort of referred to then. And that's still the case, but more like from the, um, from the like, what makes people's lives better? What can we do to make people's lives better through technology? Um, it's kind of some, a space that I'm interested in, which is how I kind of found the security and privacy. Usability plus security. But yeah, so it was pretty early. It was just like little things that were fun. So I don't know if you want to get a, a, a 90s style uh, <laughs> FTP to an ISP for your daughter and have her help her make some web pages. I think they use those Raspberry Pis now, right? Or Arduinos. Like those are the like the Yeah. Oh yeah. Now it's like way more advanced. <laughs> like now, like uh yeah. And you know what's actually really cool? I got my because I want my I've got two kids. I've got two boys. And I and I really wanted them to get into um, computers too. And I there is this oh what is the thing called? It's this like um like kind of logic table game thing, but it's physical, so it sort of gives them an intro to like and in or gates and like registers, like very basic computing stuff. Oh, it's called like Turing Turing table or something like that. I think it's called, but that thing was is super fun. I re- and it's fun to play with um, with your kid. I am not being paid or endorsed in any way to talk <laughs> about this, but I did. But it was cool. I liked it. So if, I don't know how old your daughter is, but it, um, if she's um, she, not quite old enough for coding, that's a good like entree into it. So my daughter, do- my daughter's six. So she's very, obviously very young. Oh yeah. She's very much, I don't know how she's gone down the princess route. So not that that's concerning. Cause she's still also like a, I would just like a, I don't know how to describe her, but like a budding biologist. Like she's always digging in the mud too, to find bugs. She has pet bugs. Like she has a lot of bugs in her house. <laughs> It's just kind of disturbing, actually, because sometimes I'll be like, where did the, uh, you know, this thing go? This, like, centipede thing. She'll be like, oh, I let it go. Like, where? Where did you let it go? No! <laughs> ah! Oh, my God. Centipede terrify me. So I do like cultivating that side of her, you know, the exploratory and, uh, I don't know, just exploratory imagination, but also the ability to build. Uh, so it's, I think, you know, the, we, we live in a place where probably your ability to build is, <laughs> like, I don't, I'm not sure what the jobs of her adulthood are going to be, but I'm sure you have to being able to build something is going to be very important. <laughs> oh man, that's cool. I did my, I, if she's like into biology, I got as a gift, like this little um, kid's microscope and he, and it's been like pretty fun, like smashing little things onto it. Hopefully not centipedes, but like, <laughs> like salt and water, sugar, and the less um, bug oriented things. And looking at them is like kind of fun. I don't know if she like that. Um, if it's like a, if she's got a biology uh, bent, that could be, that's um, that's been fun for us. Awesome, I appreciate the advice. Now, what else do you like to do outside of the world of work? So you're working, you're a mom, you got two two boys. What do you like to do for fun? I like, you know, I'm in Oregon, so I like outdoor stuff. Um, so like hiking and biking and camping, those are the things that um, that I enjoy on my free time. Um, hiking up mountains and. Yeah. And then some, and then, you know, going to breweries. Cause that's the other thing that we do here. <laughs> Drinking beer, going outside, <laughs> crashing subs. And I got to ask one more thing. We read that you have a patent techniques and architectures for managing privacy information, permissions, queries across disparate database tables. I'm not going to lie. I don't know what that means. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> that is part of one of the, um, one of the features that's available um, on the platform that, that's from Salesforce. And um, it is basically a technique uh, that we developed to assess consent based on uh, having multiple sources of, of consent. So it's sort of a, um, a logical, how would you interpret um, different consent vectors and what are the things that you need to think about in order to, to return a value. So it's actually part of, um, it's embedded in that REST API I mentioned earlier that um, that deals with consent preferences that has its own special permission set. So it doesn't have the view all data permission. Well, listen, I encourage everyone to read it 
Uh, go ahead and take a look. We'll link it in our show notes. I was trying to understand it. I'm like, what am I talking? What is this talking about? Uh, it's super impressive, though. I think it's awesome that you have a patent. We had the, the we had the CTO of the U.S. Patent Office on once our show, and we asked him like, well, how do your people even know like whether a patent submitted is even possible? Like, <laughs> because they don't do they even know? Like, they're like, uh. Yeah. <laughs> What are they reading? I have no clue. Yeah. Marla, it's been awesome having you on the show. Thanks for sharing your career, some of the things that you're working on at Salesforce. I blow up, I'm pretty confident you're the first person that has engineered a rock, uh, submarine that's on our show. <laughs> I'm sorry it didn't work out, but it sounded pretty, pretty darn cool. Thanks for sharing your philosophy on security and your love of the outdoors. It was awesome having you on the show. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed being here. IT Visionaries is created by the team at mission.org and brought to you by the Salesforce platform, the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience. Build connected experiences, empower every employee, and deliver continuous innovation with the customer at the center of everything you do. Learn more at salesforce.com slash platform.